Richard Reed is an entrepreneur. He's one of the three co-founders of Innocent, a food and drinks company. Now 37, he gave up a job in advertising 12 years ago to realize a dream. We have a little house rule. If you're 70% sure, then go for it. Because we're saying if you wait till you're 100% confident in business, you've got the right answer, you'll never make a decision, you'll never get anywhere. In April, Coca-Cola took a majority stake in the business. I want to find out a bit about what life's like in his shoes. Chance to smash. I'm going to spend the day with him. So, a running start to the day. Yeah, try to. First thing. Do you do that every day? <laughs> <laughs> or is that just for the cameras? Yeah, it's only because you guys hit it. I probably go three or four times a week. Mm. Sort of, it really helps, actually. I definitely, physically, obviously, it helps, but then... Mentally, it just sort of just makes everything a bit calmer. By going into business with friends, haven't you broken a big rule of business? Don't mix business and pleasure. Well, a lot of the time entrepreneurship is about breaking rules, but uh, we found the exact opposite to be true. The fact that we are friends has meant that there's a huge degree of trust, that we know each other's strengths and weaknesses, that we can be absolutely honest with each other, and as well as it helping the business relationship, I'm much closer now than to Adam and John than I was 12 years ago because we've just had this awesome ex experience together. So for us, it's, it's really, really worked. But we, of course, there are times when we argue and there's things that we do, we try to make sure that the relationship survives. So we keep the friendship out of business and we keep the business out of the friendship. It's time for Richard to get changed for work. I couldn't help noticing, Richard, this sign over here. <laughs> 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 yes, well. My wife's got a, a mischievous sense of humour, so she bought me that. Myself, Adam and John have retained the majority of our shares and full operational control of the business. So they're an investor, but we very much run the business. And they have a majority stake now, Coca-Cola. Mm. That's right, yeah. Is there a big pressure running what you want to be an ethical business? Um, we have found more often that the commercial aims and the ethical aims help each other out. So we get to be more ethical by um, being stronger commercially. When we first started out, we were three 26-year-old guys and we couldn't even get our phone calls returned, never mind engage with a supplier about the conditions under which his fruit's grown. Whereas now we have a little bit more purchase in the market and it gives us a bit more ability to, we've got the time, we've got the resource, and we've got the, just the sheer buying power to be able to really get to the, the root causes of how fruit's grown, the social conditions, the way it's transported, the packaging that we use. And we're a thousand miles away from being as good as a business that we want to be, but we have managed over the last few years to really take some big strides in making the business much more um, robust on its ethical credentials. So just quickly take us through where we are now. Okay, so this is going to be our new home. Yes. Isn't yet. So we've taken that whole building. And I guess what we love about it is it's got one foot in the old world and one foot in the new world simultaneously. So and there's is, a barge. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're right on the Regent's Canal here. What we're all about is we need to make this as, as healthy a workplace as possible. So one of the good things is about there's a huge amount of natural light. Second thing is we're putting in a gym right in the centre of the building, we're investing hugely in making sure there's loads of showers and bike racks so people can cycle to work. Sail away with me, honey. Put my heart in your Sail away the first appointment of the day is with colleagues and architects at Fruit Towers 3, the company's new offices. In terms of the atmosphere at the company, what are you trying to create in these new offices? Well, we want, a, we want people to be able to feel natural and sort of just work in the way that they work best. And that typically means sometimes people need to be by themselves in a quiet place. Sometimes it needs to be together in a room where they can shut the door. Sometimes it needs to be in a big open space where people can just share ideas and, and chat. But fundamentally, the word we use the most often is community. A sense of that we're all part of it and you can drop in and then drop out of it depending on the nature of the work you've got to do. As a business we work to a very very 
low profit margin because our whole economic structure is the money goes into the cost of the fruit, which goes into the ingredients. So what we've got to do is constantly find cheap but good ideas. But every single bit of furniture, anything we can move from Fruit Towers to is coming here. We are literally going to be unscrewing tabletops and bringing every bit of furniture from the meeting rooms and transplanting it here. Because A, environmentally, we don't want to throw it away, and B, we can't afford to. See, the problem is, it's more, the way you run your offices, the table football, employees walking around barefoot if they want to, is that to conjure up a good working environment, or is that to project an image to the outside world, or is it both? No, I mean, that's just about people being natural, it's one of the things that we, you know, we we urge the most. But do you walk around barefoot? Um, if it's a really hot day, then I do sometimes. Yeah. When do you move in? We move in in February. So by August, we'll have signed off all the plans, down to the absolute, the finest detail of what shower head are we having, and then that whole specification gets priced up, and then a contractor comes in and fits it all out. So actually, you're joining us when we're going right now into the minute eye of saying what tap, what tile, what shower, what locker, just because you've actually you've got to go through it and you've actually got to choose that one, not that one, and how much does that one cost and how much does that one cost, so. So talk me through the bean bags. Well, the bean bags are just a, a little example of the way we do things. They're, they're very cheap, yeah. so commercially they make sense. But they're also really practical because they're easy to move in and out of meeting rooms. Yeah. And so wherever we need to sort of deck somewhere out, we can take these little fellas. But also they have a certain bit of brand kudos to them as well. It's a famous story, but just tell me how you set up your business. Well, it was born out of friendship. So John, Adam and myself all met at college. We always talked about how much we'd love to set up a business. But for four or five years, kept talking about it and never did it. Then we were on a snowboarding weekend at the time, and we said to ourselves, look, we've either got to stop having this conversation or come up with an idea and take it seriously and, and get on with it. Otherwise, we're just going to drive ourselves completely bonkers. So we came up with the idea of smoothies because we were three 26-year-olds living in London, drinking too much beer and eating too much pizza and really not looking after ourselves. So we had this idea of, well, we'll make it easy for people to be healthy, little bottles of crushed fruit. We came back from that snowboarding weekend, and then we, we just started from first principles because we didn't know any other place to start. We'd never set up a business before. We shared a house in Barons Court in London, so we'd make up recipes in the evenings and weekends and then try them out on our friends and family. And got to the stage where we had some recipes that people said that they liked, but realized we just didn't have that confidence to go and resign from our jobs full time. And the thing that we were missing was some people that didn't know us buying the products at the price they needed to pay for them and saying that they like them. You know, when you're doing your product development on your mum, you've got to hope she says that it's decent, you know, but you need someone that doesn't know you. And we, we were given a great opportunity because there was a local music festival in West London where we lived. I thought, now here's the perfect opportunity. The type of people that are going to go to that festival are the type of people that we hope would buy our drinks. And we had taken literally our last 500 pounds of cash, bought a load of fruit and turned it into our favorite recipe at the time, and then sold the smoothies from this stall. And above the stall, we put a big sign that said, should we give up our jobs to make these smoothies? And had a bin that said yes on it, and a bin that said no on it. And asked people to buy the smoothies, drink them, and then vote with the empty bottles. And at the end of the weekend, the yes bin was full. And we'd made a commitment to each other that if the yes bin was full, we would go in the next day and resign. And so we had this sort of sweaty Sunday evening in our kitchen in, in our house at Brown's Court where we said to each other, we said we were going to do this if the yes bin was full, and it was. So we did. The next day, we all resigned from our respective jobs and then went about setting up the company full time. The shaky first few months or first year? Oh, it was a disaster, absolutely disaster, because we had absolutely no sense of it. We were completely naive about it. We thought, I remember I had the conversation with my boss at the time saying, we're going to be out to market within three to four weeks. And he just laughed and said, that's impossible. And I said, oh, you don't understand. We're so passionate about it. We're going to find a way to do it. And we had completely misunderstood the difference between doing it once for a market stall versus doing it day in, day out to sell to shops. So what we thought was going to take three to four weeks took a year. And it financially bankrupted us because we had no money coming in. We only had our last month's paycheck. So by the time we got to the, the start line, we were 
you know, tens of thousands of pounds in debt. We just lived off breakfast cereal for three times a day for the previous nine months. And the interesting thing is we had been told no by every single potential investor we'd come across. It was no after no after no. And it was only right at the 11th hour, after nine, 10 months of being told no, when we were gonna throw in the towel, we sent out an email that just said in the subject line as a joke, does anyone know anyone rich? Because we've been turned around by every bank, every venture capital firm, every investor network. And so we sent out this email, we spammed half of London with it, and we got two responses back. One from an old school friend of John's who had a few years ago done work experience in the office of a guy that sometimes invested in businesses, and he introduced us to this guy called Maurice Pinto, and he was the guy that gave us the money to set up the business. Did your friends buy you drinks during that first tricky year? Again, it's another thing that I've always felt really lucky. Our friends were amazingly supportive. So yeah, they, would, they just would refuse to allow us to buy a drink whenever we'd go out in the evening. Some people might ask whether you feel you've compromised by doing a deal with Coca-Cola. Mm. Yes, and we did get some negative comments in the press at the time. The reality is it's allowed us to do more of what we've always set out to do, which is make natural, healthy food, get it to as many people and places as possible, and then support charities. Now, we're, our business is now bigger. We're selling more smoothies, getting more healthy products to people, and are gonna be able to create more value, which means more cash going to the charity. So everything that we've always said that we're about, we're getting to do more of with this deal rather than less of. Does the responsibility sometimes get to you of being a boss? You take it really seriously, and we've had We've had tough years. You know, we had a tough year in 2008 where we, we, our sales went down dramatically and we, we lost a lot of money and we, we had to make people redundant. And that was the first time in 10 years we've ever had to do that. And that is the absolute antithesis of why you set up a business, to stand in front of a team of people that have taken a risk and come to work with you and then you say, well, we're gonna have to let some of you go. That was by far and away the worst moment in my career. One of the great features about this new home for us is that you get this awesome view across London. We're right at the top of Labbrook Grove here, so it's an area that's got some real soul and character. But also there's a bit of history of the company here. We set up the business just 50 yards away, just the other side of that building. And we love the fact that we've, you know, we've, we've the, the journey continues. You know, 10 years ago, we were three guys in the little room over there, whereas now we're in this building and a team of 200. Next up, we're gonna go see this great charity that we support called Find Your Feet. We do a lot of work in India, which is a country that we have a trading relationship with because we get a, a lot of our mangoes from there. But we also like the idea of the charity sort of comes in alongside and will invest in rural communities out there. So we're gonna meet some of the people that run it. And I go really to check, is the money going on the things it's supposed to? Is it? Are we getting a good return? But interestingly, because it's the charity, we look for return on human betterment. So it's not about return on investment and cash and profit back in, it's about how many lives are we positively affecting. Linda works for the company's charitable foundation and Katrina for one of the charities it supports. They didn't have land, they couldn't feed their family. Um, and they were living on £6.30 a month. It's just sort of, it's totally incredible, isn't it? You, £6.30 a month. Yeah. It is. It, it's bewildering. Yeah. And, and, and then when... That have been every month, because there were some months when they wouldn't even get exactly, that. Exactly, yeah, yeah, so the work wasn't regular, so yeah. sometimes they would, they would literally ha have nothing. And I think for us, that's why agriculture is so important, because we work in rural areas and there is access to land, um, it's really important for us to support families to make the most of their land, or as, as Sujata did here, was actually to buy some land. How early on did you decide to get involved in charity? Well, we've supported charities right from the beginning. The, um, the breakthrough moment, though, came in 2004 when we started working with Linda and really professionalised it. Up until then, we'd be doing it on the side and doing it in a very sincere way, but not particularly effectively, whereas Linda's come in professionalised it, so it's a separate registered charity. Right. Welcome to Fruit Towers. This is where it all happens. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Delia. I'm Rio with Office Angels. Um, You're what? Office Angels. What does that mean? We, we just bring joy to people's lives here. So this is the chill out area. Table which, football. Table football. Table tennis table over there. And say this is the main, um, this is the main centre of the community at Fruit Towers. And we use it in many different ways, but the main thing is that Monday morning from 9 to 9.30, the whole business gets together, so we'll have all 200 people stood here. And just going through what's going on in the business that week. And the floor? Mm, the grass. Explain the floor. Well, we, we needed something to cover the floor with, and we didn't have much money to spend, and it turned out that the father of one of the guys that worked here had a business that made this stuff, and we took one look at it and thought, well, that's perfect. And it's grass, and it's not real grass, but it's closest we could get to it in, indoors and it's cheap, it's affordable, it looks cool. You're taking it to the new office. Yeah, we're taking it to the office. It's become, you know, if you see, we've covered our vans in it, we've covered our floors in it, we're going to cover our new office in it. So this is a tradition we started when we first set up the business and everyone has to come with a picture of them when they're a baby. I think it's because when they're looking, they're most innocent, basically. And Where's yours? In fact, there, there I'm here. From that to that. Yes. <laughs> Not That's sure. where all those ideas are whirring around. Is that the big forehead there? <laughs> <laughs> basically, every month, someone gets awarded Lord or Lady of the Sash, is what we call it. And it's basically uh, the, the staff member that's been voted for for being the, the person that's contributed the most to the business. So, really, you know, done extra great work and really looked after their teammates. And everyone gets to nominate people. And once a month, we award it to either the lord or the lady depending on whether they're a guy or a girl and they get given a sash and a top hat if they're a guy and a tiara if they're a girl and then everyone at the company meeting has to get down and pledge allegiance to them and promise to make them cups of tea for the whole month so it's completely ridiculous and a bit stupid but again it's just a way of celebrating people that are really getting that extra mile you ready yes Do you feel responsible for the people who work here? Oh, we're definitely committed to making sure it's a great place to work. Um, because we want the absolute best, most talented people to come and work here. So we take that responsibility seriously to make sure it's a workplace where you can come, take on challenges, be supported in developing your skills and getting rewards when you you know, when you deliver good work. How do people get any work done when there's table tennis going on? Well, this is the first ge game of table tennis I've ever played whilst here. <laughs> so people typically use it in lunch times in the evenings. It's rare to see someone playing during the day. So now I'm setting a terrible precedent. You are, you are. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's the only time I've ever played is during the middle of the day. It's, go it's going very badly. Yeah. <laughs> it's time for Richard to do a tasting in the room where the smoothies are developed. We can taste it with you now. Sure. So this has got the blend of New season Polish and Serbian raspberries. That's clearing the palate, is it? Yes. Have a little water before you try it, but then in between, we just have a tiny bit of a water biscuit. Just gets your palate back to neutral, because otherwise, your, the flavour builds up from smoothie to smoothie to smoothie, so you have to try and get back to zero each time you're going to try a new recipe. Yeah. So let's taste peaches and passion fruit. These guys are doing a good sales job on you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's really annoying if I say I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, no, definitely. We don't launch anything until we've had a big group of consumers try it and say that they love it. So I'm here to give my input. And if I said I think that's grim and I could explain a reason why, then we might think yeah. about having another go at it. If I just don't like it and I, it's just because I don't like the particular fruit and variety, then it's not a subjective thing to my taste, but it's, if the consumer loves it and I don't, it will still get launched. But so you just boot him back out if he starts being <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> if it's not what we want to hear, yeah, we'll... Uh... Do you get nervous? They've learned how to manage me. They've learned how to manage me. Do you get nervous when he comes in? No, no. not at all. No. We've got another meeting, haven't we? Here we have. I'm going to go meet our new starters. We have a little house rule. If you're 70% sure, then go for it. Because we're saying if you wait till you're 100% confident in business, you've got the right answer, you'll never make a decision, you'll never get anywhere. And the flip side is we don't want people making reckless decisions either. But if you've done the homework, if you've thought it through overnight, and you're 70% confident it's going to work out, then push the button. So if you're ever sat in a meeting looking at the, you know, this new initiative, this new product, and you're thinking, that's rubbish, you've got to say, 
that's rubbish. You've got to say it because then I'm really in fear of the time where everyone's sitting around sort of yeah, exactly, saying yes, but secretly thinking no. And that's how rubbish things get to market. Next, it's a chance to meet one of the other co-founders of the business, John Wright. How do you decide whether to take risks or not, or when to take risks? Um, I guess you're, you're always trying to have a... Uh, if you don't take risks, you don't create value, you don't move forward. So you've got to, inherently, you've got to have risk to, um, to grow the business. And I think the art is deciding how much you take on, and that if, as a business, you are... Uh, kind of putting risk into your plan that you're doing different risks in different areas so it's not all one big bet you're going to have a bit of a take a bit of a risk on that and a bit of a risk on that and some of them are going to come off and some of them aren't and your business has got to be able to move forward on the basis that you'll get it right two-thirds of the time so. and how often when you're making big decisions do you guys agree and do you agree with Adam as well well that's one of the interesting dynamics is that we've never disagreed on the big decisions because we've gone through the numbers, talked it through, looked at it from the different angles and then we've always sort of got to the same place individually but we have had absolutely massive screaming rows in the past but they've been about the most insanely small things like the biggest arguments we've had have been about what colour we were going to paint the office floor, what colour we were going to paint the office wall and the biggest grass, though, surely. It's well, this is be before green. we discovered before grass. Before grass. <laughs> but the, the, the biggest argument in our 12 year history was about where we were going to put a bookshelf. Now, that's not really a high level strategic decision. Who won that argument, John? <laughs> I'm sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely won. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Richard's giving a talk at the British Library as part of its Inspiring Entrepreneurs series. What is the best thing about being an entrepreneur? The best thing about being an entrepreneur is, um, is that you get a sense of you can change things. You know, that actually, um, we'd never set up a business before. We thought we were going to fail. Everyone said it wasn't going to work, but we kept going. And it's actually, so far, it's, it's, you know, it's come good. And that's such an exciting, liberating feeling to realise you can, with no experience, have a go. And if you're prepared to work really hard and keep going at it, you might get there. I'm in absolute awe of anyone who sets up a business and by themselves. It's a very lonely, very brutal experience. Doing it with a small team increases the likelihood of success and makes it a more enjoyable ride, in my experience. Let's introduce our third speaker uh, tonight, Richard Reed. I was a 16-year-old kid working in a dog biscuit factory in, in Huddersfield, where I sort of grew up. and. It was during the summer holidays, and my job was to pick up the dog biscuits that fell off the conveyor belt <laughs> onto the floor, and it paid two pounds an hour. And I remember being on my hands and knees picking up these dog biscuits, thinking, this is really quite a rubbish, <laughs> rub rubbish job. But there's something about me, I'm quite geeky, and I wanted to do a, you know, I wanted to do a good job, and I figured out, oh, well, if I got a broom, I could do this so much more effectively. So I went up to the foreman and said, you know, in a very sort of polite 16-year-old, Voice, you know, excuse me, do you, do you have a broom I could borrow? And I promise you, he looked me dead in the eyes and just said, son, you are the broom. <laughs> That's literally the absolute split second when I decided I wanted to become an entrepreneur. So the only commonality between every single successful person, whether they're in arts or politics or business or sport, is there are two features, is that they started and that they didn't stop. And it's the not stopping bit that really gets you to the success. So I know it's a really patronizing, easy thing to say, but it's only because we didn't stop. And I would have stopped myself hundreds of times because it was so brutal getting the business up and running. It's only because I did it with two of the people that when I was having a tough day, they might have been having a good day that we kept each other going. Afterwards, Richard finds time to pass on some business tips. Coming along and doing this this evening, it's an hour and a half. Maybe I might have helped a couple of people solve a couple of little riddles at the moment, because it's hard, certain business is difficult. So if there's some way that we can pass on a bit of the information, then we, you know, we try and do so. Right, should we go? Okay.